good to see you on this beautiful spring day. This last Sunday it was a beautiful spring day. Today it was a beautiful spring day, and in between we had winter. Spring in Saskatchewan. It is good to see you, though, whether you're joining us in here or online, uh, either you know, in real time or um, throughout the week. However, you come to worship, I'm really, really glad that you do. I know that you have. Other things you could do on Sunday morning, you could sleep in, you could go visit friends, you could go for a walk, you could do all sorts of other things. But you choose to take some time out of your day to come and join the community of faith for worship, and I'm grateful for it. A few announcements that are in your bulletin. One is, is that time of year, it is our Spring Into Action food drive, and that is next Sunday. Um, so next time you're at the store, if you have the ability to do so, I'm inviting you to put something extra or a few extra things in your cart uh, to help supply our food banks. Now this is not meant to be a pressure if you are not able to do that uh, for whatever reason. That's perfectly okay. Don't feel bad in, about not being able to. Um, but if you can, we're trying to help our food banks, especially after the holidays. Uh, we do this in October after Thanksgiving, and uh, we're trying it again in the spring after Easter. Those are big times for the food bank. They see a lot of people um, and give out a lot of food, and it's always nice to be able to help them restock and replenish a little bit. Um, the donations from here will go to the Gravelberg Food Bank. The donations from Limerick will go to the Assiniboia Food Bank. Um, and they both are always in need. Um, we know more and more in the last couple of years as prices have gone up, more people have needed the food bank, and as prices have gone up, more people have not been able to donate as much. Um, and so there, it's this fun little cycle that means that they need more and more. So if you uh, can donate, we please appreciate it. If you have not yet filled out your Let's Talk forms, please do so. That, remember, is the survey um, of what we're doing now and what we might look to in the future for our congregations. Children's Church will be next Sunday, April 28th. And please stay after church today for our AGM for La Flesh here. The Apostle Church 1 will be May 5th, and that will be after the 1130 service, and it will be here in La Flesh. Uh, so please plan to stay for that as well. Uh, thank you uh, to Danelle for all of her work, always decorating, and to the Music Festival Committee for putting it all back together again uh, after festival this week. To, as we've heard, there is pizza after, after service, uh, so thank you to Sherry and Dave for your hospitality uh, duties and for lunch. To Dwayne for doing our tech for us this morning, and to Sherry for always sharing her music with us. Our music license number is A6091189 of One License LLC, and our music is reproduced with permission. We begin our worship by acknowledging the territory. As always, we begin our worship by remembering where we gather. As we acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 4 territory of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect and honor the treaties that were made on all territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present, and we are committed to move forward in partnership with Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration for a better future. As always, we read the bolded parts for our call to worship. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice. We are part of God's wonderful creation. Let us rejoice and be glad. Come, let us worship God. And so we light our Christ candle today as a reminder to us that life is always going to overcome death. That love will always overcome hatred, and light will always overcome darkness. And so we light our Christ candle to be reminded of God's presence in our lives now and every day. Will you pray with me? 
Holy One, we come before you today as strands in your beautiful tapestry, aware only of our corner of the great whole. Help us to recognize you as the seamstress of our lives and to see our fellow humans for the beauty and wonder they add to the final masterpiece. Teach us your way of love and compassion and be with us as we go out into our daily living. All this we pray in the name of Jesus our companion and Christ. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 402 in Voices United. We are one. Saying that there is another king named Jesus. 
the people and the city officials were disturbed. And when they heard this, and after they had taken bail from Jason and the others, they let them go. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction, just as you know what kind of people we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word of joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place where your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of these regions report about us what kind of welcome we have among you, and how you turn to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Today we're going to have a little bit of an interactive children's time, and actually sermon time as well. Um, just giving you a heads up. Feel free to leave now if you desire. Not you. <laughs> we need you for the music. I'm wondering, as, as you read this, as, as I read these scriptures, especially the one from Acts, I think about Paul and how... Things didn't always go very well for him. <laughs> Ultimately, he ended up being successful in what he was trying to do, but he got ran out of town a lot. <laughs> he angered a lot of people in the doing of that. And so I'm, I'm thinking about that and, and that example and wondering if there are times and places in your lives that something similar has happened, that something ultimately turned out well, but in the doing of it, you were like, Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> it's maybe, I, maybe I just got to throw in the towel. Maybe I've got to change how I do something. You know, but ultimately ended up going well. Anybody have any thoughts on that? So I'll give you an example. When I was in seminary, I... Uh, I may have told you this story before, but I've known I wanted to do this and was called to do this since I was 13 years old. If you ask my mother, I was two or three, but like when I was actually putting words to it and saying, hey, I want to be in United Church ministry, I was 13. And by the time you get to seminary, things are a little different. <laughs> Right? You, you go and, and you're learning new things and you're not so sure about everything anymore. And I also had the added challenge that I did one semester of classes and then dad died and I took a semester off. And then I went back to classes again. Now, keep in mind in this story, I should not have gone back after one semester. <laughs> I should most definitely have taken a full year off. But I didn't. My theory, it was not a good theory, my theory was I was tired of all this grief stuff. This, this was not working for me anymore. So I was going to go back to school, and if I went back to school, then I would focus so much on my studies that I wouldn't have time to grieve. I wouldn't have time to miss dad anymore. Everything was going to be hunky-dory and rainbows and unicorns. You can guess how well that worked. So my first semester back, I almost failed every class. Like, not, oh, ha, 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 I almost failed, but I got an 80. No, like, I literally was at the lowest grade you could get without failing the class. And one of my classes, I only passed by the grace of my professor who gave me an extension for the summer and let me go. So, at the end of this, 
it's the end of the year, and uh, uh, the United Church requires that a report be sent on every student to uh, the Time Conference, now Regional Council, and by our academic, uh, academic advisor. My academic advisor didn't really know me very well because he'd only had me for this one class that I just about failed. And so he said, well, how would you come in? Um, we'll have a conversation and we'll write this together. So we, I go in and that sounds all good, well and good. I go in and the question is basically like, what, what promise and um, readiness for ministry is this person showing? And so he asked me, you know, what do you think? And I tore a strip off myself. Up one side, down the other. I'm horrible at this. If I can't pass my classes, how in the world am I going to actually be in active ministry? There's no way I should be doing this, blah, 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 blah. If he had written that report, I would have been yanked from the program immediately. <laughs> my, my candidacy would have been terminated, and life would have been very different. And I, God bless Bill. He was, uh, Bill Morrow is somewhat of a, a gruff exterior, uh, but he has a heart of gold. And I remember he looked at me after I'd just about ripped myself to shreds. And he says, well, I don't think I'm going to write that. <laughs> I remember saying to him, well, what do you mean? <laughs> Like you asked my opinion, you wanted me to write, you wanted me to help you write this. Now you're not listening to what I said. What was the point of me coming in? And he says, I think I'm going to write that you've had a rough year. And if a year from now, when I have to send in this report again, you still feel this way, then we'll talk about it. And I'm grateful because by the end of the next year, by the end of the next semester, I, you know, not, I wasn't an A-plus student, but I had raised my grades a little bit. I was in a better space, you know. I was still grieving, but not in that intense, intense way. And I'm grateful to that because ultimately, it ended up well. Ultimately, I was able to progress through my studies and, and be ordained, and now I spend my time with you fine folks. But along the way, <laughs> <laughs> there were some rough spots. And I think the same with Paul. And I wonder if maybe that's something that resonates with you as well. Any, any thoughts of, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. That, that reminds me of this time. Or anything along those lines. I think that's what Paul does, right? He teaches us that it's okay to fail. <laughs> That it's okay to not get everything right the first time. Because arguably, Paul is the, like, starter of the Christian faith, right? Like, not Jesus. Jesus is the one who taught us all this stuff. But Paul is the one who goes out and gives it to everybody and says, Here, <laughs> take this. I want to tell you about it, right? And he doesn't always get it right. And in fact, he ends up changing. He uh, eventually becomes what is, what is often termed as the apostle to the Gentiles. He eventually figures out that, you know what, I'm not really getting anywhere with the people of the Jewish faith. We're, we're not quite connecting. That's better. Peter's doing a great, better, much better job at that. Let's let Peter do that. And I'm going to talk to the Greeks and the Romans and all the other people. And we're going to do our own thing both in service of this early church, both in service of Christ. And so I think it's important to, to remember that, you know, it's okay to not get it right. It's okay to change your mind and change how we're doing things as we go along. Um, and that we're not alone in that. If, if Paul can do that, well, then surely the heck we can too. Our next hymn is going to be number 291 in Voices United, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
being hit Pentecost, which is at the end of May. Um, and so as always, we kind of have to situate where we are. Um, between Christmas and Easter, that's usually easier to do because we're often, you know, picking up right where we left off, right? One chapter ends, the next chapter is the next week. Um, or, you know, maybe there's a, a couple of days in between, uh, but mostly we're still in the life of Jesus, which is only three years, right? Um, this period of time is a little more. So we have, of course, the crucifixion and the resurrection on Good Friday and then on Easter. And after the resurrection, uh, Jesus appears to his disciples for 40 days. He hangs out with them. He walks on the road to Emmaus with them. He breaks bread with them. He bakes, makes them breakfast on the beach. He talks to them and says, put your hands and put your fingers in my hands. Um, he just generally spends time hanging out with the people that he loved and who loved him. He does that for 40 days, and then he says, see you later, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm heading up to heaven. I'll come back at some point. In the meantime, you all keep going. Um, we hear in Matthew that this is where he says, you know, you go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we hear this reminder that Jesus is with them, even as they are, uh, even as he is not anywhere physically with them anymore, and they are meant to go out. So then we have Pentecost, when the disciples are all hanging out in a room together, and the wind comes, and the flames of fire, the tongues of fire, and the speaking in tongues, and all of that, and the early church starts. The disciples, who have now become apostles, disciple means learner, apostle means one who is sent out, they have now been sent out, so they are no longer just disciples, they are apostles. And they head out into the world, and they start going and telling people about Jesus. Now, the, this is gaining some traction. They are um, starting to be a, a sect within Judaism, a denomination within Judaism, calling themselves the way. And this is going fairly well, until they meet a guy named Paul. Well, Officially, he's named Saul at this point in the story. Saul has this, you know, really big hate on for uh, the, the people of the way. And so he goes to his higher-ups and he says, I want to go and arrest everybody. Will you give me permission to go arrest everybody? And they say, sure. Probably just to get him out of their hair, if I have to guess. Um, Paul, uh, Paul and I have a love-hate relationship. I'm pretty sure at some point that they just wanted to get rid of him and send him to Damascus so they didn't have to deal with him. So he's on his way to Damascus. He's ready to go and arrest everybody, try them, you know, um, uh, try them for blasphemy and for doing things differently. And along the way, as often will happen, Jesus shows up and changes his direction. Big light comes, voice from heaven speaks, Paul falls off his horse, and he's blind. He's blind for three days. Eventually, he gets his sight back. And when he does, he has done a complete 180. He has turned from going and getting ready to arrest everybody to being the biggest proponent of the gospel <laughs> that there is. And so he starts going and telling everybody, hey, there's this guy named Jesus. He's really cool. You should listen to him. You should listen to me and let me tell you all about him. And so he starts traveling, and he starts going and, and starting churches in all of these areas around the Roman Empire, and then when he moves on to the next place, he writes back to them to answer any questions they might have, to just tell them, hey, I, I'm thinking about you, I remember you, right? Thessalonians, the, the book that, or the, the church that we're reading about today, is early in his ministry. He's probably writing the letter to the Thessalonians, so after he's left them, he's probably writing that by about 52 AD or so, so like 18, 19 years after Jesus uh, was crucified, and he was probably in the city around 49 AD. So today we, we heard from Acts, which is the narrative version of, of the early church. It's a follow-up to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is written by the author telling the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. 
and then Acts picks up where Luke like leaves off and tells the story of the early church. A lot of it's about Paul. Some of it's about Peter and the other disciples. A lot of it is about Paul. And I think when, when we read these stories, when we read about Paul and his interaction with people as he goes out to proclaim the gospel, it raises a couple of questions for me, both, both in this particular story and in others where he's uh, going to the Romans or going to the Corinthians or going to all of these different places. It raises the question of what do we believe? And, and what difference does that make in our life, right? Paul knew what he believed and he wasn't afraid to say it, even if it got him run out of tail. But he knew he was secure enough in his belief. He did, that didn't, doesn't mean that he didn't change. If you read Paul's writing, not in the order in which you find it in the Bible, but in the order in which it was written, because they're, they're different. If you read it in the order in which it's written, you see this progression of Paul's thoughts and beliefs. It's not to say that he said, oh, this is what I believe for all time. But he knew whenever he was talking to somebody, he knew and was comfortable saying what he believed at that point in time. And it also raises the question of what do we do when we encounter people who are different than us? Right? Paul is going to, um, in this story, he's, he's going into the synagogues. He's going to another sect of Judaism. They're, they're similar but not quite the same. Right? This is not even an interfaith thing yet at this point. This is just interdenominational. This is, we're all still Jewish. We just follow this way of being, and you follow that way of being. And he does so respectfully. Right? We hear in, in today's scripture, it says he went into the synagogue and he argued with everybody, and he tried to prove you know, that the Messiah was the one who needed to suffer and die. And we, we read that with our, our ears and our modern ears, and we say, well, that's not very polite. <laughs> you don't show up at somebody else's house and start arguing with them. But that's exactly what you do when you're in the synagogue. That's, that's the cultural way of being, is to have those types of conversations. And, you know, here's my proof, and here's my proof, and we're both going to use scripture, and we're going to have a conversation about it. And so the, it raises those questions for me about Paul, and it raises those questions for me about us. What do we believe, and what do we do when we encounter difference? There's a book I remember reading when I was in seminary that's called um, How to Think Theologically by Howard W. Stone and James O. Duke. Not O. Duke, O. Duke. <laughs> And they talk about everybody having two types of theologies. That they have, we all have both embedded and deliberative theology. Embedded is our first understanding of the faith and the actions and practices that that entails, right? It's those things that we've learned and have been reinforced in us by our environments, whether that's our environment in the home, whether that's our environment in church, whether that's our environment in society at large. It's the things that we're taught as children that we may or may not still believe today. But at push comes to shove, we probably fall back to it and say, well, that's what I believe about God. They can be big things, like whether or not God exists, or if Jesus was actually the Christ or just some nice guy who traveled around for a while. Or they can be smaller things. Like, how do we dress on Sundays? Are we allowed to wear jeans to church? Are we supposed to be in our Sunday best? Or where we can worship God? Can we only worship God in these walls? Or can we do it at the supermarket? Can we do it in the field or in the garden? Some of our embedded theologies change or are discarded when we move, <coughs> move them more intentionally into deliberative theology. And others will continue for our whole lives. But nevertheless, everyone does have these embedded theologies. They're, they're embedded. They're not something we consciously think about most of the time. 
Deliberative theology, on the other hand, is that intentionality. It's the understanding of faith that emerges from a process of carefully reflecting upon embedded theological convictions. That comes from how to think theologically. It's that idea of being intentional about thinking and saying, okay, hey, this is what I believe. This is what I've been taught to believe. Do I actually still really believe it? And the answer might be yes, and the answer might be no. So for instance, when my mom was a, was a child, she was told, you cannot wear jeans to church. You have to wear your Sunday best. God will not love you if you wear jeans. And she thought that was, as a teenager, she thought that seemed like maybe not the kind of God she wanted to believe in. You know, and she thought that this was maybe not what God was caring about. God would probably just care that she was in church to begin with, not caring about what she was wearing. And so she thought about it, had intentionality about it, and moved into a deliberative theology that said, no, that embedded theology of you have to, you can't wear jeans, is not something that I think is, is true anymore. I'm leaving that and changing that. So it became a deliberative theology that said, God loves me regardless of what I wear to church. She passed that on to me. So my embedded theology is that it doesn't matter what I wear in church. I can dress up if I want to. I can wear not so nice stuff. Like you're not going to wear something that says F you on it. But, you know, you're, you have to still be respectful. But it doesn't matter. That's my, that was my embedded theology. As I grew up and became a teenager and an adult, I looked at it with intentionality and I said, you know what? That embedded theology does work for me. I do think that God loves me regardless. And so my, it becomes my deliberative theology that God will love you regardless of what you wear to church, and it does not matter. Everybody has embedded theology. Everybody should have deliberative theology. Neither is better or worse. It's just a matter of which one we fall into. There's a guy on uh, TikTok named Jeremy Steele. And I love, I love his opening to his videos. I found him by accident one day, um, and I've watched a few of his videos. He in introduces himself as a deep skeptic and also a pastor. And I love that. Because it, it reminds us that we can hold both of those things together. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you have to believe everything that the church teaches. It doesn't mean that everything has to be exactly as you were taught as a child. And so he had a, a video that uh, he opens up by saying, there are only three things that I am almost sure about, about God. Almost <laughs> sure about, about God. And God existing isn't one of them. Which I think is interesting. He says, if though, if God exists, and he's in this period of his life where he believes that it does, obviously he is in ministry. He says, if God does indeed exist, there are three things that I am almost sure about about God. God is loving. God is gracious. And God includes everyone. And it's our job to become more and more aware of that as the, as the world progresses. He invites people on that video to think about what it is that they're sure about, or almost sure about, in their faith. And to share it with him uh, through the comments. And I, I love, he says, you know, and if you don't, if you're not sure about anything, he says, feel free to try mine on. <laughs> And try them for a little while and see how they fit for you. So my invitation, I told you this was going to be an interactive uh, sermon time as well. My invitation is going to be that you get into groups of two or three. Um, maybe move around the sanctuary a little bit if you so desire. That whole side of the sanctuary is empty if you <laughs> want to go and try out that side of the pews. Um, and answer or think about or discuss two questions. What do you believe? And that can be big things, that can be little things, however you want to define it. 
What do you believe? It can be the things that you've been raised to believe and that you're not sure about right now, the things that you've had deliberative time and intentional time to think about. So what do you believe? And what is your standard way of reacting when you encounter difference? Because much like embedded and deliberative theology, we also have embedded and deliberative ways of reacting to all sorts of different situations, including when we interact with someone of a different theological idea. And so it's important to think about, you know, we may have been taught this is the way you interact with people who are different than you, but also, what is our intentional way of thinking about that? So I'm going to invite you, we'll have a few minutes, uh, to have some conversation amongst yourselves of what do you believe and what is your standard way of reacting when you encounter difference or someone who is different than you. And I'll invite you to join in groups of two or three. Thank you for, for taking part. I think it's important to start having those conversations in small groups of people who love us and who we love um, so that we can you know have some conversation about and really start to be intentional about what it is that we believe um, so that when we go out into the world we have some firm thoughts on that as i said i uh, paul and i don't always get along <laughs> um, but that's okay uh, but i do appreciate a lot of things about him even as i don't appreciate a lot of things about him as well. Um, I appreciate that he's human, and he doesn't always get it right the first time. I appreciate that he knows what he believes, but he's willing to change and grow. And I appreciate that you know, he does really model for us what interdenominational and interfaith dialogue looks like, um, even in, in when it goes well and when it doesn't. Right? The, the scriptures tell us both sides of that story, uh, and I think that's an important thing. So my hope and my prayer for you today is that as you leave today, you go thinking about what you believe and what difference it makes to your life. Because it's nice to say, well, I believe this, but if it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't make a difference in your life, well, what's the point? Right? If you say, I believe God is loving, and then you go out and say, well, I hope God's loving so I can be crabby to everybody, <laughs> maybe you missed something there. Right? I, I hope and pray that you will take some time to be intentional about how you encounter difference and how you live that out. And I hope and pray that as Paul says, you may know the grace and peace of God and Jesus in your life today and in the days to come. Amen. I didn't realize that uh, Francesca was going to use the bulletin that had the creed on the back, so I also included it in the bulletin. So you have two choices as to where you would like to read the creed from. Um, but I invite you to join with me in these words that we say as a denomination of what it is that we believe. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make you, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We have been given much, and so we give back out of that abundance of our time, our talents, and our treasure, our life, our love, our hopes, our dreams, everything that we are and everything that we have. I invite you to think about what it is that you offer as we sing our offertory song, uh, God of Life, We Are Your People. It's to the tune of In the Bulb, There is a Fly. It's printed in your book.
God, these are the works of our hands and the love of our hearts. We ask that you accept these gifts that you first gave to us as a token of the love that we have for you. May they be used to further your work in this church and in the world around us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. For our prayers to the people today, I thought that we could use the blessed prayer that we used, uh, I think it was last year sometime, and the year before that, but haven't used for a while. Uh, remember, B is for body, L for labor, E for emotional and environmental, S for social, and S for spiritual. So I invite you to join me in the prayer. Holy One, in Jesus of Nazareth, you took on human flesh, a human body, and walked to this earth. And so we pray for the other human bodies that you have created. The ones that are in life, the ones that are nearing death. We pray for the health and the well-being of ourselves and others. We pray for the bodies that are in danger around this world through hunger and famine, through violence, whether that be on an international or national scale or in the private home. God, hear our prayers for our bodies. We pray for labor, for the work that people do, for the things that are seen and celebrated and respected and respectable, and the things that we wish could just be pushed aside and we didn't have to pretend that anyone did them. And we pray for those who are unsafe in their labor environments, we pray for those who are fighting for fair and equal working conditions, for safety, for those who are unable to find work. But here are our prayers for our labor. We pray for the emotional and the environmental. We pray for the emo emotional well-being of others and for your creation. We pray for those who are unsure and uncertain of what tomorrow will bring to face mental and emotional illness. We pray for those who are part of this creation, whether that be people or animal or plant or rock and mineral. God, help us to not damage your creation any further, to care for it as you first expected us to do, so that in time it can be called good and very good again. God, hear our prayers for our emotional and environmental health. We pray for social, for relationships, for relationships that are strained or broken. For relationships that need strengthening and those that are strong already. We pray for our human family, for the vulnerable, the isolated, the hurting, and the marginalized. God, hear our prayers of social concerns. And we pray with the minds of the spiritual. We pray with an openness to seeing something new, to seeing you at work in this world. We pray wondering about what it is that we believe and okay when, it's, when we're not so sure. God, hear our prayers for the spiritual. God, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, who is our companion and our Christ. And so we continue in the words that he taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our 
final hymn this morning is number 49 in More Voices. That's the Spiral Bound book, When We Seek Language. Friends, as you go from this time and place of worship, may you go walking with our companion in Christ. May you go taking intentional time to think about what it is you believe. And know always that you are held in the Creator's embrace. And so as you go, may God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up the light of her countenance upon you and give you peace this day and always. Amen.